I love that song. Sometimes at certain occasions of your life, some songs mean more to you than others, but that one, where I'm standing right now today, means a lot to me, and I'm grateful that we can worship and praise the Lord. I'd like you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to Exodus chapter 34. And uh, we're going to read uh, the first uh, nine verses, so let's stand and give honor to God's word. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by morning and come up on the mountain to mount in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone like the first, and he rose up early in the morning. He went on Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took in his hand two tablets of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood before him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord a God uh, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity on the fathers, on the children and the children's children to a third and fourth generation. And Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth, and worshipped. And he said, Now if I found favor in your sight, O God, please let me go, Lord, in the midst. Please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for this, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Thank you. You may be seated. I find it very interesting, you know, as you look at the Bible, it has lots of commands. God makes a lot of commands, but the one command that God treasures above all of them, the one command that, that he wants honored and for us to comply with more than all the commands that he's given to us, is that God wants us to love him. God wants us to love him back. And he's even defined the quality of love that he wants from us. He says, love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And what's interesting about this command is God has supplied his children with all the resources from his grace to us and the Holy Spirit. He's given us the ability to keep this most important commandment. Because I don't know about you, it'd be very frustrating in life for God to ask me to do something that I couldn't do. Right? It'd be very frustrating. And God doesn't frustrate us by asking us to do things that we are totally incapable of doing. But he has graciously supplied us with the inner strength from his spirit that he places into our lives as we are saved and given our lives to Christ, we, we are given that ability. So what does it mean to love the Lord my God with all my heart? That's what we want to look at today. What does that mean? To love God with all my heart. I really believe when God says he wants us to love him with all our heart, he's wanting from us a very passionate, loyal, undivided commitment of our heart to him. He wants our hearts to be consumed with love for him. He knows, or he wants to know, that we love him so much that there is no one, on, no one else on earth that we love more than our Heavenly Father. It's a, he wants a, a passionate, and an intense love. And as passionate and as intense 
is our, as is our love for maybe our spouse or for our children. God wants that heart, that attitude, that, that affection to come from me to him. And he wants people who are overwhelmed by him and all that he has given to them in their life. He wants to give them to give their heart back in love for him alone. Now, we read Exodus 34 just a couple seconds ago. And the background of this passage is, is Moses is going uh, back to the mountain to replace the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments that Moses broke. Um, God says, let's do this one more time, Mo. Let's get this right now. Uh, and there's a reason why Moses broke these tablets. He came down with them, carrying these heavy tablets, excited that he had just met with God, and he was excited to bring God's law, God's gift of love, back to his people. And what does Moses find? The people are worshiping a golden calf that they have made and this has become their idol of choice. This has become their graven image. This has become their God that they are now wor worshiping and dancing and getting drunk and, and doing their things, uh, sort of praising this, this, this idol. And Moses is so ripping mad, he takes the stone commandments and throws them on the ground, and they break. Moses is disgusted. He's disappointed. He takes the golden calf from his, his bro, uh, Aaron, right? And, and he, he disintegrates it. And yet you see in Exodus 34, God demonstrating his love for his people in his willingness to say, hey, let's start over again. Well, let, let's, let's redo this. He wants, he wants, again, them to renew their commitment to love him, and he is renewing his commitment to love them. And you have to realize, this came at a, after a very blatant rejection of God, right? I mean, you look what's going on. I mean, it's a very bold and selfish move on the part of the Israelites to reject God by doing something God told them that he hated. God hated two things, idols and images right? Idols that people attribute godlike powers to and worship and images trying to capture, in a sense, in a human sense, human understanding, something that can't be captured, that is God. So that's really what the calf represented. We don't know what God looks like, but we're going to try to put a human spin. We're going to try to bring God down to our human understanding. So this is what we think he's like, this golden bull calf. And God said, don't make any graven images because I can't be represented in anything human. I'm too great for that. I'm too beyond your comprehension of my character, my, my being, right? And so God was truly uh, dishonored by the people through these Accident. And God would have every right to wipe them off the face of the earth. And some of the Israelites did perish for their deeds, but here God returns to them and reminds them that he's a God, he's, he's compassionate and gracious, and slow to anger, abounding in love and kindness and truth. He keeps his loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. But I want you to look at verse 14. I didn't read this verse in the passage. But this verse, it'll be on the screen. It says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, we just started a new Sunday school class. I will, I'm inviting you all to come uh, based on the names of God. We found out God had over 200 names listed in the scripture, and the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are up to 700 names because you can't just put God into one name. He's so great. He's so mag magnificent in all of his, all of what he shows us in his word. But uh, we see God is a jealous God. You find in Numbers chapter 25, verse 11, it says, God turned away his wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them. And then in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, 
You shall not bow down to idols or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. His name is jealous. He's a jealous God. So you go, what are we to make of these statements when God says he's a jealous God? In our minds, that seems somewhat confusing, doesn't it? Because when we think of jealousy, we think of sin. We think of something bad, right? But as I was doing some study, jealousy can have a couple sides to it. It can have a bad side. Like, let's say, a, a husband who sees his wife talking to another man and gets very much jealous because she's talking to another man because he's insecure about his relationship and he's fuming and, he's, and he has to show his, his, assert his authority. And that, that's the bad kind of jealousy. But the good kind of jealousy would be if that woman, the man talking to that woman, that man's wife, was trying to woo her or seduce her or tried to, to sway her away from her husband. Then that kind of jealousy to protect the fidelity of the marriage would be very a good kind of jealousy. And that's the kind of jealousy that we are finding in this text. This is a God who loves people so much. He is jealous over them. He desires to have them in a relationship. And there are no rivals to him because none compare to the power and the goodness and the grace and the magnificence of this God and his love for us. That's why he's jealous. And really, this jealousy is a zeal, a passionate love of God. It speaks not of petty, selfish, sort of insecure individual, but a God that has the right as God to be solely recognized and worshipped for who he is. He has that right. God's name is the essence of who he is. And he says, his name is jealous. Jealousy is not just a passing mood with God. It is the essence of his person. And since God is the highest and the greatest being there is, infinitely holy and glorious, he has to be passionately committed for preserving the honor of his name and its supremacy. He has to be zealously uh, desirous of exclusive worship from people because he's the only one worthy of it, right? To do less, to act in, in a lesser way on God's part would to make him less than God. God says in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. You see, God is sovereign and supreme over all. Were he to share his glory with other so-called gods, he would be elevating them and diminishing himself. He would be elevating so-called gods to things that they are not while diminishing himself at the same time, away from the preeminent God that he is. So God has to be faithful to himself, and he has to maintain his high and holy position. And he basically wants his creatures, those who have been the, the focus of his love, to attribute to him that degree of honor. So his jealousy does not grow out of insecurity or anxiety or frustration or un or uh, uh, for his uniqueness or his supremacy above all. Wait a second. His, it does not grow out of covetousness or pride or spite. That's how we uh, act in our lives. It is the natural and necessary byproduct of God's absolute sovereignty and ho infinite holiness. That's what God's jealousy is all about. If God, by virtue of his essential being, must be jealous for his uniqueness and supremacy above all, then those who know him and want to please him should be jealous for him just as he is jealous for us. And if we are serious about our relationship with God, we should exalt him above anyone and everything else in our lives. We shall be absolutely dedicated to living to his honor. 
We should be zealously committed to doing his will because he's the only one. He's the only one worthy of that kind of action from us is our God. The primary goal of our lives is to show the world that our God is the one true living God and he alone makes life meaningful and worthwhile. And what it says more than anything to me is that God is intensely in love with anyone that he's committed to in a relationship. God intensely loves you. He's jealous for you. He loves you that much. He set his divine affection on you. And he's committed his heart to love you, to care for you, to provide for you, to shower you with many blessings. And he wants those who have been the objects of his love to respond to this love by loving him back with the same intensity and desire that he's shown to them. And I ask the question, shouldn't God really be able to expect that from us? Those who have been the recipients of his love, right? Shouldn't he be able to expect that those who have been given the privilege to know him be related to him, be given eternal life through his son, be claimed by him as his children, that they would completely give their hearts back to him and that love would go to no one else, nothing else in this life? Wouldn't God expect that because of the quality and the intensity of his mercy and grace and love that he's given to us? He is jealous because he's extended himself in love to us. And he's done many great and marvelous things for our benefit that he wants us to love him in return. And when we don't, when we give our hearts to someone else or something else, when we reject his love he, uh, and we off, the love he offers to us to someone lesser, something else that is far inferior to God, it grieves the heart of God. He's jealous for us. God has an intense personal commitment to you if you have a relationship with him. And he is eager to protect what is precious to him. God wants to protect what is precious to him. You know, God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. But that the way this is stated, that God is a jealous God, it really says that God wants us. God wants a relationship with all of us. A personal relationship. And God went to a great extreme to make that possible for every one of us. When we were estranged from God, alienated, uh, in hostile condition because of our sin, our rebellion, our rejection of God, at our weakest moment and our worst moment, God sent his son into the world, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins so that we could be restored, we could be reconciled, so that we could have an Abba Father, a great, great Father, that's who he is, that could be our Father, and that we could have that ultimate and intimate and personal relationship with this God who is who is deeply in love with all that he has created. And this is why God commands us to love him with all our heart, with all our heart. And the question I ask you this morning, does God have all your heart? Does God have all your affection? Does God have a passionate love for you, from you? Do you demonstrate that in your life? Well, you say, how do I communicate my passionate love for him? Well, you know, I've been married for 31 years. How about on my anniversary, if I walked up to my wife one day and said, Honey, here are some flowers for you. And I'm giving these flowers to you for three reasons, three strategic reasons. Number one, I am your husband. Number two, it's our anniversary. And number three, husbands are supposed to give wives flowers on their anniversary. Here they are. Wouldn't she just be thrilled? I don't think so. Who wants love as an obligation, right? Like, who wants that? Well, I kind of, well, it's, you know, it's the thing I'm supposed to do. Miss Manners told me that or somebody, you know. 
No, my wife wants me to love her passionately. She wants to know that there's something in my heart behind this action. She doesn't want duty. She doesn't want what's expected. She wants desire. And I think husbands could probably say the same about wives. God doesn't want our duty. He wants our desire. He wants us to come from our heart. He wants to see passion, intensity, and heart in our love for Him. God doesn't want the attitude that says, well, I guess I better go to church today because God's expecting me to be there. Right? He doesn't want a ritual. He doesn't want a religion. He doesn't want rules and regulation. He wants to know that you're in his presence because there is no one we love more than him, and we want to tell him that. Is that why you came this morning? You came to tell God that there's no one you love more than him. There's no one on earth that you worship, that you believe is worthy of praise more than him. That got you out of bed this morning. That, that, that made you decide against other things you could have been doing today because I wanted first and foremost the first day of the week to come and to come to a place where people like me are telling God we are passionately loving you with all of our heart. And he wants to hear from us how much we love him. Now, I, I know this can be difficult for some people, especially guys that give flowers. Number one, because it's an obligation. Number two, because it's our anniversary. Number three, because that's what's expected of me. And I know some guys that are like that. There's not a whole lot of passion in anything except for sports or, you know, those kinds of things. We have lots of passion, but the passion just drives for certain things in life. So it can be difficult at times for people who are not naturally good at expressing affection in life. So how do I expression, express my heart, my love for God with all my heart? Here, if you've never done this before, I'll tell you how to get started. Just do this. Start by saying thanks to God. Just start saying thanks. Being grateful. Grateful for today. Grateful that you have life. Grateful that you have limbs. Grateful that you can breathe. Grateful that find reasons to say, God, I give you thanks. When I found out I had cancer, I did a lot of that. Because I didn't want darkness to come in my soul and be a person who said, oh, why me? Why me? I didn't want to be that kind of person. Because I believe God brought this to me for a reason. God had many things to fulfill in my life through this illness that couldn't be accomplished in my life without this illness. So I embraced it as a gift. And I read a little reading uh, from my utmost from his highest that said uh, that my desire should be uh, the willingness to obey God even when it's a call to suffer. That I would delight in obeying God in experiencing suffer, suffering in my life. You're going, man, he sounds like a weirdo today, right? That's, that's so totally un-American, right? Embracing suffering, delighting in obeying God in hard times. But I want God to be glorified. I want his, his name to become magnified through my life. I want him to know that even if my life is on the shorter end of time, I don't know. Things are going good now, and I'm praising him for that. But you know, whatever it is, I want God to know before I die that I love him with all my heart. That I'm passionately loving him, because life hasn't always been that way for me. I could get so tied up and wrapped up around the axles in life with all the problems, all the situations, all the things that come my way. Carrying people's burdens and my own burdens and my own challenges in life. That, that I can be that guy that gets so wrapped up in trying to fix every problem, fix this and fix that. That life can get frustrating 
and somehow the passion and my love for God can just go away. I can lose it. And then I could get into this dead orthodoxy where I just come to church and I preach these sermons and I tell you all this stuff. But, but is it really coming from a heart that loves his heavenly father? I'm telling you, today it comes from a heart that loves his heavenly father. So start by giving thanks. Look around. Find ways to tell God you're thankful. If you got your kids with you, give thanks for your kids. Yeah, they're not perfect. Sometimes they give you a little bit of a little bit of static, but give thanks for them. Give thanks. I can also express my heart of love for God through putting my heart into worship. Worship Him. Praise Him. I mean, I've seen the intensity of some of you people when you go to sporting events. You I see the passion. You know it's there. You get off that bleacher. Going, why don't they do that at church? They're supposed to sing now, you know? Where's the passion? You love God? I'm not saying you have to get crazy with it, right? Worshiping is another way that we can express our love for God. Another way that God really, lo- that shows your heart, that you love God with all your heart, is obedience. Obedience. You obey God. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You just, you just find, when God says something, you just say, God, I know you love me and I love you back. I'm just going to do this. I, I know some of the commands might seem hard. They might be difficult. They may see a little bit of a challenge, but, but because I love you, God, and I know you love me, and I know why you gave those commands to me because you love me, and you're trying to protect me from myself and my sinful desires and my fleshly lust that you gave me in love, some prohibitions. You said no to some things. You said yes to some things. You're guiding me because you love me, and I want to love you back because it's in my heart to love you, and out of my heart, I want to obey you. Obedience is another sign. Giving is another way. Serving. All these kinds of things are just ways that we can express our love for God. Is my heart into it? Do I love God with my heart? With all my heart. You know, it's easy to tell in life when someone's heart's into something. Can't you tell that? You can tell, you know, when their heart's into a golf game. When they're making birdies and things are going well, it's kind of, you know, the strut and my heart's into this. And when the bogeys and doubles and triples, it's kind of like, uh, can we get this round over? Because my heart's not really into this. But you can tell when your heart, your energy is into something. You give it, you give it time. You give it your energy. You give it your passion. You give it your enthusiasm. You give it your money. You give it your attention. You give it a priority when your heart is into something. We put our hearts into all sorts of things in life. We all have passions in life that motivate us and drive us. These passions are driven by love. They're driven from the core of our being. God's love for us is to be the inspiration that drives our passion back for him. We love him. Why? Because he what? He first loved us. That's why we love. That's where the motivation comes. I love God because he first loved me. Maintaining a very strong love and heart for God is not a very easy thing in our day, is it? We, we face many pulls in many different directions from many earthly things that want our affection, that want our heart, that want our passion, that want our love. There's many things that are always out there saying, come after me. Many idols, many, many images, things that go after this. If you give your heart to this, love this, worship this, this will make your life so much better. All competing for the love of your heavenly father. 
And it's kind of interesting in, in Second Cor- or First Corinthians chapter, or Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Paul kind of sees this happening to a church, some people in a church. He says, I think this is on the screen. Uh, is that up there? Yeah. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband. What is Paul saying? When he preached the gospel and people responded, he said, I married you to Jesus Christ. A relationship started. When you became a Christian, you were married to Jesus Christ. I betrothed you, what? To, to one husband. Christ is now your husband. He is, he's the groom. He's the one preparing the wedding feast for us, and he's coming back for the wedding day when he takes us to heaven to be with him forever. I have betrothed you to one, one husband to present you someday as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid. That as the serpent deceived Eve with his cunning, your thoughts, your affections, your heart it will be led astray from sincere devotion and pure devotion to Christ. Your first love. He's I'm afraid of that. So I'm asking you, did you know when you became a Christian that you were married to Jesus Christ? That he's your first love? More than any other love in your life, Christ is to be your first love. And I can tell you, a lot of times where physical marriage, where marriage between husbands and wives go wrong is, first of all, and first and foremost of all, um, the marriage to Christ isn't the strongest marriage. Many people enter marriage with their marriage to Christ not being the most primary relationship that I love Jesus more than anything else. And then, because of that, that heart, that affection that's going many different directions, it's hard to keep that marriage going because my love for Christ has suffered somewhat and now it's affecting how I relate to my, to my spouse. I'm expecting things from my, my spouse that I need to get from Jesus. And I'm not satisfied. I'm, I'm upset because there's things that are supposed to come from Jesus. My first love. Maybe you never knew this. And to give your heart, your love, to any other person or any other thing than Jesus, the Bible calls what? Spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery. It's kind of, a, kind of an interesting passage in James chapter 4, verse 4. They're pretty strong words, and James is just uh, kind of letting loose on some Christians because what's happening in their lives, and he's saying it because it seems believers are taking their relationship with Jesus for granted, and he's noticing that they're being swayed away from their number one love for Jesus. Their heart for God, to love him with all their heart. And what does he say? You adulterous people. Now, I don't know if I was preaching that sermon today. There might be some people walked out if I said you're adulterous people. But James is saying that. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not, not, or see, or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he, God, yearns jealous, jealously over the spirit he has made to dwell in us. I'm going, what is that about? You know what? God put his spirit to dwell in us. And God yearns over his spirit being allowed the freedom to motivate us passionately with love for him because we grieve and quench that spirit. By going after other things and other people to be our primary source and focus of love, we grieve God's, the spirit of God is saying, put Jesus first. And we're saying, no, I think I want this first. I want to love this more than Jesus. So we put down the spirit in God. God jealously yearns that, that his spirit that was made to dwell in us would have the freedom to empower us to love God with all our heart. Question is, I have to ask myself, how many times in my life have I quenched or grieved God's spirit? Have I told the spirit no? When he's saying love Jesus. Give your love, your heart to God. Don't go after this. Don't be swayed by this. 
So I asked this morning, who is your heart in love with? Who is your heart in love with? One look at our life will tell the real stories. Priorities always tell who our first love is. Your checkbook will tell. What you do when no one else is around will tell who you love more than anything. There are many professing Christians in the world who who are living today guilty of spiritual adultery. They're just playing religious games, living to deceive others about the condition of their heart before God. But God knows whether or not we love Him with all our heart. He knows that. He knows the condition of our our marriage to Jesus Christ and whether or not our, our heart is fully in this relationship with Jesus. And he's given us more than enough motivation to remain completely loyal to our Savior, to love him with all of our heart. Does my life prove that I I love God with all my heart? If it doesn't, is it time today, because God loves you, and God isn't easily offended, he's a God who stands waiting, with his love and grace and his arms open wide to receive you back into his love. That's God. God stands open to forgive us by his grace and welcome us back into his loving fellowship if we've strayed from that. And if you've never been in that fellowship, if you've never been in that relationship with your good, good father who loves you with all his heart, who is jealously, passionately in love with you, he stands open today through Jesus Christ to welcome you into his fellowship. All he says is acknowledge that you've sinned, that you've, that you've rejected my love, and say, today I want to reach out to you, Jesus, and I want you to be my, my groom. I want to be married to you. I want you to be a part of my life. I want you to save me, and I want you to fill my heart with that love for God that I need to have to live a full and complete and satisfying life. So it really matters not if you're a Christian today or if you're a non-Christian today. Wherever you're at, is God getting love from you with all your heart? Is your heart into it? I can remember when I first met my wife on the campus of Sioux Falls University. I couldn't stop thinking about her weeks on end. Nights sweating out at the UPS trailers, loading boxes. I was so glad I didn't have many missorts because I was thinking about my wife, not the zip codes on the package. The woman had caught my attention, my heart, my affections. She was on my mind all the time. Is God is it that way with God with us? That we're thinking about him all the time? We're thinking about how good he is to us and how much he loves us and how much he's there for us and how much he's he's there even in the hard times to walk with us through the the valley of the shadow of death through through major surgeries of seven and a half hours and all the kind of recovery. Do we know that God's love is there? I have felt God's love so great in my life of late. How could I not return that back and say, God, I love you? So as we just bow our heads and we're going to sing a song, um, it's called Set Apart. The words are powerful. If you want to renew your heart and your love for God today, because you know maybe... Maybe you've given your love to something else. It's had a higher priority of love in your life, and maybe life is frustrating, and you, maybe you're here to like to give your heart to God today, to love Him and to thank Him for sending Jesus to die for you. Whatever your expression is, it, and whatever God's leading your heart to do, I, I'm going to be here. I'd love to pray with you if there's a spiritual. One of our elders would love to pray with you. If there's a spiritual need, you just like to say, God, I want to renew my love for you today because it, it's maybe, maybe it's shifted away from you. Maybe your heart is being given to someone else and it needs to go back to God. Maybe it's time today to give and surrender your heart to Jesus so that you're prepared to die. You're prepared for your eternity. 
let God have his way. As the song is sung, as you sing with it, we'll be here. Love to pray with you.